Jerome Blake, Prime Administrator of Comstar and celebrated hero of the Star League Civil War, collapsed on May 11, 2819, during a meeting of the Comstar First Circuit. Long suffering from health conditions attributed to wounds sustained on Dieron while fighting to liberate Terra alongside Alexander Kerensky, his fall did not immediately raise any alarms. Released from hospital the following morning, just three days passed before a grave illness took hold of him. A thorough medical examination revealed the severity of his condition, and the prognosis gave him just a few days at best. That evening, the First Circuit gathered at Blake's home amidst the Green Mountains of Vermont, ostensibly to pay their respects, but the gathering more closely resembled a wake of vultures. Among them were the chief administrators of New Earth and Dieron, Herman Schweppes and Blake's longtime companion, Conrad Toyama. Schweppes had become the leading voice among the council and was the main advocate for a more aggressive Comstar believing that their stockpiled weapons should be used to take control of neighbouring systems, re-establishing the Terran hegemony and potentially even a second Star League. His keen political and business acumen made him the person most likely to succeed Jerome after his passing. Toyama, by contrast, once a close confidant of the Prime Administrator, had become increasingly distant. To outsiders, his relationship with Blake appeared more strained with each passing year, a rumour that was no doubt purported by his political rivals. Though Blake's condition had robbed him of his health, it had not dulled his mind. Also present at his home was Michel Dupree, chief of Comstar's internal security agency, ROM. Personally loyal to the Prime Administrator, a source of great contention among the First Circuit, Together, they conspired to change the course of history. Dupree agreed to lend their agency's full support to whosoever Blake should name as his chosen successor. Toyama was the last to be called to Blake's bedside, and the two spoke for three hours in isolation. Dupree swept the room for bugs ahead of him to ensure their secrecy. Jerome confided in Conrad his fears that Comstar would not long survive him, especially if Schweppes began moving openly, drawing the attention of the successor lords. The Great Succession War in 2819 had been raging for more than three decades, claiming the lives of tens of billions. This abhorrent loss of life and the corresponding massive decline in technology had radicalized the Prime Administrator. Though some form of ceasefire seemed imminent, Nobody truly believed a lasting peace would hold, as animosity between nations and peoples had only grown during the war. Blake feared that if given the chance to rebuild, humanity would be doomed to repeat the same apocalypse within the next three decades. And so, he charged Toyama with a terrible duty. Rather than allow the successor states time to rearm, he would instead work clandestinely to ensure the war was resumed as soon as possible. In this second succession war, the destruction of mankind's most dangerous weaponry was to be prioritized, until hopefully, they lost the ability to wage interstellar war altogether. Only then would Comstar step forward as a bastion of knowledge, and through them, mankind would rise again like a phoenix from the ashes. But such a task was beyond the capabilities of Comstar in its current guise. The organization would need to transform in order to undertake this radical mission. Here too, Blake had a suggestion. Upon his passing, Toyama would present his carefully doctored journals to the world and work to establish a new technocratic religion, sanctifying their actions up to this point and elevating Blake to sainthood. Though at first appalled at the suggestion, Toyama ultimately accepted his friend's request. At midnight on May 15th, 2819, Blake passed in his sleep. Conrad emerged from the room carrying his old master's journals, with a written edict from Blake naming him Prime Administrator. He demanded that its authenticity be affirmed immediately. Dupree backed his claim, and the other chief administrators acceded, if only temporarily. But tensions soon grew, reaching a crescendo when the First Circuit next met in July. 
Hermann Schweppes took to the floor to outline his plan to conquer the inner sphere by force of arms, part of which involved placing Rom under the control of the First Circuit. His proposal had support from several among their ranks, but Toyama would not countenance it, instead demanding his resignation for flagrantly undermining Comstar's neutrality. After adjourning the meeting, Conrad called for Dupree to put in motion the plans they had drawn up over the last two months. Within 48 hours, Schweppes and three others on the First Circuit were dead. A vicious purge was undertaken by Rom that gutted the organization's leadership. In less than a week, a full 29% of Comstar's administrators were either imprisoned or executed. Some fled Terra and made contact with Davian agents on CAF, where they were offered asylum within the Federated Suns, but pressure from Comstar soon saw them turned over. On July 26th, Konrad Toyama chaired a meeting of the new First Circuit. There, he proclaimed the formation of the Comstar Order, with himself at its head as Primus. With the purge that would later become known as the Purification still fresh in everyone's memory, he was free to reshape the organization as he wished. Conrad began by unveiling their blessed founder's journals, the sacred word of Blake. Citing passages within as his inspiration, various religious trappings were instituted across all levels of the organization's new hierarchy, and the ROM crackdown ensured that all members of the order, from lowly acolytes and adepts to the ruling precentors, followed their new directives. Technical operations, once cold and clinical, were now performed with greater ceremony. Lastly, Jerome Blake's body was declared a sacred relic, his corpse embalmed and placed on display at the Hilton Head Hyperpulse Generator Station, where it has been lying in state for over two centuries. In 2820, Toyama toured the successor state capitals, just as his predecessor had at the war's outset. And the following year, the delicate peace Jerome Blake had feared took hold across the inner sphere. The first succession war was over. Planning for the second began immediately. In the aftermath of the brutal First Succession War, a great, great many problems presented themselves. In the Free Worlds League, before any action could be taken to correct them, the issue of the vacant Captain Generalcy had to be resolved. Thaddeus Maddock had been killed in action in one of the final battles of the war, a senseless death given that his posthumous victory was rendered null and void by the Bella Accords. His eldest child, Jeanette, was next in line to the throne, but she surprised everyone when instead she declared in June her intention to join the nascent Comstar Order, with the reins of government instead passing to the middle sibling, Charles Manick. Charles immediately set about strengthening his position, including orchestrating a subterfuge that saw his popular younger brother accused of treason and banished to the periphery. In Parliament, there was division between those who believed that rearmament was vital, and others who were crying out for aid and reconstruction. The latter camp was championed by House Allison of the Grand Duchy of Oriente, along with their allies the Syrian Concordance. Both provinces lay on the border and had suffered constant attacks during the war. The Captain General, however, erred on the side of those who wanted to channel all available resources into rebuilding the Free Wells League military. He blocked the proposed reconstruction bill to focus instead on weapons procurement. It was an unpopular decision, and Charles was accused of risking the tenuous peace by undertaking an arms build-up. However, it was ultimately one that would prevent the League's collapse once hostilities resumed. This crash rearmament was a decision mirrored by the other successor states, affirming the belief that none expected the peace to last. 
Before leaving the first succession war behind for good, we'll take one last look at the Great House militaries in 2821, at the end of that terrible conflict. The 2820s were a decade of rebuilding for the armies of the Inner Sphere, so it's important to understand where they had been left. They had begun the war in near perfect condition, with all the spare parts and munitions they could hope for, but they had been completely gutted by three and a half decades of attrition. There are no surviving records for conventional forces, among which the infantry were especially hard hit by the flagrant use of chemical weapons. But we do have numbers for the frontline battle mech regiments, from which we can extrapolate a loose idea as to the condition of the other branches. Reviewing the figures, it becomes clear just how close some of the successor states were to a complete collapse. The Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery began the war with 146 battle mech regiments, and raised a further 9 over the next 35 years. On the surface, they had lost 22 regiments, plus a pair of Sword of Light units that reformed twice over, to bring them down to a total of 133 at war's end. But counting losses within the surviving units show us that overall, the DCMS lost almost exactly 60% of their battle mech strength, the surviving regiments averaging around 44%, or four companies. The Capellan Confederation Armed Forces began with 118, built 15, lost 25 but reformed Vincent's commandos again, to end the war with 109 regiments. The CCAF had lost a little over 57% of their pre-war capabilities, the survivors again averaging around 43%. The Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces started with 120 after the 10th Sky Rangers had already fallen during the Phony War. They constructed the most of anyone at 18, and also privatised the stealths. The LCAF lost 8, including the 2nd Lyran Guards twice, ending the war with 131 regiments, the only realm to have more than they started with. They had been the least impacted by the casualties, at under 52%, but the survivors averaged the same 44% readiness. The Free Worlds League military had the fewest mech regiments to begin with at 117, after losing two units during the Phony War. Nine more were raised, but 23 were destroyed, including the entirety of the Boland Defenders Brigade, leaving them just 103. Just under 62% losses brought the remaining FWLM units down to an average strength of 44%. The armed forces of the Federated Sons had started with 132 battle mech units, not including the 56th Avalon Hazars lost during the Phony War. Many of those were overstrength reinforced regiments, with four battalions apiece. Thirteen new units had been added to the rolls, primarily in the form of military academy training carters, but an abysmal 34 had been destroyed, leaving them 111. They had lost more than 62%, the worst of anyone, but the survivors were just fractionally better prepared than their neighbours, at over 47%. The use of mercenaries increased substantially during the First Succession War. Few of these were fanatically loyal and unlikely to continue fighting for a doomed cause, but at the same time, there were just as many units of questionable loyalty within the regulars. Adding these to our totals gives us a complete picture of the battle mech forces in 2821. Looking at the quality of those units, we can see that proportionally, the number of green forces increased while experienced troops decreased. Life expectancy was so low on the front line that few mech warriors would live long enough to acquire the skills to become veterans. Likewise, the loyalty of post-war militaries was notably less reliable than before. No matter how dire the situation ever got on the ground, the lowest survival odds belonged to the crews of warships. In 2786, 916 such vessels were known to exist in the successor state navies. A handful had already been lost during the Phony War. In total, just 75 were still in service in 2821. The chances of a warship and her crew making it through to the end were a tiny 8%. Besides those few survivors, Comstar had hidden an unknown but likely small number at secret locations, and in the periphery, just a single barely functional hulk still lingered in the Hades Cluster.
In the Draconis Combine, Coordinator Jinjiro Kurita found himself unqualified for the task of rebuilding his battered nation. Very much a wartime leader, he struggled to handle the more mundane elements of government, turning instead to his half-brother Zabu Kurita. The relationship between the two was distinctly atypical, one that could only have arisen in a realm like the Combine that places such emphasis on martial prowess and demands high respect for one's elders. Jinjiro himself was the son of his father's concubine. As such, he would never have been in line to rule, but with his military academy record being so exemplary, Minoru ultimately decided to recognize him as his heir. Zabu, meanwhile, the true blood descendant of Minoru and his wife, but ten years Jinjiro's junior, was content to be subservient to his half brother while living a life of luxury at home. During the war, he had proved a capable logistics officer in the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery, but this won him little acclaim. His talents did not go unnoticed by Jinjiro, however, who now sought to employ them during the short peace they had won. Zabu Kurita was appointed the People's Reconstruction Effort Coordinator, establishing the PRE Academy on Dover soon after. Zabu also introduced the infamous company store policy in 2822 for dealing with mercenaries. The idea was to offer monetary incentives for agreeing to purchase all their supplies through Kurita's requisitions department. However, the increased payouts would obscure the even greater costs, gradually making those units in their employ indebted to House Kurita until eventually they would be forced to permanently join the DCMS as a way of avoiding bankruptcy. 2822 saw a number of new mercenary regiments come onto the scene, and others disappear. Duke in exile Lawrence Nelson had returned to his homeworld two years prior at the head of the newly formed 12th Vagan Rangers. After launching a counter coup to reclaim his position, he agreed to continue his service to House Davian along with his regiment. The Capellans suffered an early loss when two of the Andurian Hazars mutinied after being repeatedly passed over for resupply, joining Steiner as the dismal disinherited. Liao would recoup some of these losses when survivors of the Fomorians entered service with the 12th Starguard the following year as Paget's war ponies. Within the Free Worlds League, Cilicia's defiance were destroyed by a then unknown attacker. We know now it was a covert raid by the Capellan Quirisiers to weaken their opponent ahead of the outbreak of war. First Prince Paul Davian was another who was spreading his responsibilities among trusted family members. His brother Peter was highly placed in the military, while his brother-in-law Lord William Stuart was a strong political supporter. Discourse was already breaking down between the Capellan Confederation and Federated Sons. In October of 2822, ambassadors arrived on Siam to discuss terms for a prisoner transfer. Chancellor Ilse Liao demanded a high price to release her captives, and threatened that if they did not pay, she would order their death. Her guests balked at the initial offer and tried to negotiate a lesser sum, but to no avail. On Christmas Day, Ilsa tired of their stalling. Twenty POWs were marched out and executed, among them two generals and a high-ranking marshal. The First Prince eventually caved on January 30th, dispatching two jump ships laden with goods to buy the freedom of the other hostages. The whole ordeal soured any chance of a post-war working relationship between the two states right from the start. Within the Lyran Commonwealth, the Estates General reconvened in 2822 for the first time in over a decade. One of the key points of discussion in government was Konrad Toyama's decision to increase costs on using the HPG network. The organization had just unveiled their new sigil, and their religious metamorphosis was making those around them wary. The Archon was in poor health at this point in his life, and on June 14, 2823, Richard Steiner passed away, leaving control of the realm to his son Marcus. He faced an immediate crisis of his own design, 
when together with the Estates General, he passed the Reclamation Act, a bill aimed at taxing Comstar as a foreign organisation doing business within their realm. In its entire existence up to this point, Comstar had never overtly taken a stand against one of the successor states. The emergence of Rom had shown that they were willing and able to resist any attempts at espionage against them, but no one foresaw how Toyama would respond to the Reclamation Act. On October 3rd, 2823, in a first for the Holy Order, he declared the interdiction of the Lyran capital Tharkad, cutting it off from the HBG network and the wider inner sphere. Coming at a time when the Lyran Commonwealth was frantically trying to organise its recovery efforts, the interdiction had disastrous ramifications. So much power was centralised on that one planet that their already unstable economy was thrown into the lurch. The Lyran Intelligence Corps also had their work disrupted at a time when a resumption of hostilities seemed probable. Coming so soon after the end of the First Succession War, their neighbours were not in a position to take advantage, but the successor states did learn from this unwelcome revelation several key lessons. First, they had wildly underestimated just how much control Comstar had over them by being the sole provider of interstellar communications. Having to rely on jump ships to physically carry messages was simply not practical, especially given their recent scarcity. Second, they saw that the centralised way their governments were structured risked opening themselves to new dangers if anyone were daring enough to attack a capital's HPG directly. The trappings of feudalism had been in evidence within the Inner Sphere for many centuries by this point, but now more than ever there was a push towards regional command and control, each nation adopting a more feudal system of government. While the Lyrans struggled, Toyama again toured the stars in 2824, this time on a recruitment drive. He paid particular attention to the neglected periphery, which his predecessor had largely written off. The Primus was looking to rebuild his staff with individuals who had not known the old Comstar, who he could more easily manipulate into believing the pseudo-religious explanations on how their technology worked. Marcus Steiner held firm against Comstar for as long as he could, but increasing pressure from those around him eventually forced him to concede defeat in the autumn of 2824. Toyama ordered the interdiction lifted 72 hours later, 400 days after it had begun. Their triumph over the Lyran Commonwealth was celebrated among Comstar's first circuit. They had proven themselves capable of standing up to the might of a successor state. The Primus had achieved everything he set out to with the interdiction. Buoyed by this victory, Konrad Toyama began formulating more sinister plans. Before the decade was out, his manipulation of events behind the scenes would plunge humanity into the bloody inferno that was the Second Succession War. And there we go then guys, the first chapter in a brand new 13 part series on the Second Succession War. Now when I finished the last series, quite a few people left me a comment saying I'd forgotten to mention Jerome Blake's death and the purification and Toyama taking over. That was not a mistake on my part, I, I deliberately left it out because it's setting the scene for the Second Succession War, which is, in my mind, very much Comstar's war. It is the war that they wanted, the war that they won, essentially. Everyone else would suffer in exactly the same way, but it was instigated by Comstar. And at the other end of it, everyone's exhausted yet again, but Comstar's uh, power relative to everyone else has only increased. Now this series is going to be shorter than the previous one. I think it's going to come to around about four hours altogether. Uh, it's more or less exactly the same length, the scripts this is, as the Reunification War. But back then I was still speaking like a million miles an hour, so uh, I don't know if you'll be able to tell any difference in my voice, uh, if it's going to come out sounding exactly the same. I have a slightly different home setup now, uh, still using the same microphone, but I've now suspended blankets around me to try and uh, deaden some of that room noise. I don't know if it makes any difference whatsoever, you can tell me. Now the next episode is going to be one of the shortest in the series, probably a little under 15 minutes. 
Uh, it's going to focus on two things, mostly the Draconis Combine, uh, starting with the Chain Gang missions. The first offensive action of the Second Succession War, it's debatable whether it's even part of the war yet or if it begins a few years later. Also in the next episode we're going to be talking about the Minnesota tribe. Now quite a few people have asked how I'm going to discuss them given that the series is ostensibly covered in 3025. I'm not going to give a definitive answer just yet because the Inner Sphere doesn't have one. It doesn't really matter in the history of the Second Succession War who they actually were, just who the Inner Sphere thought they were and that kind of informs the way they responded. So yes there is more to their story but we'll save that for another point down the line. If you've stuck through to the end, thank you very much for watching. If you want to support the channel, you can leave me a like, leave me a comment. I read every single one, I promise you. I try to respond to as many as I can. Subscribe if you want to see more videos similar to this one. We've got a lot more coming, another dozen in this series. And if you want to, there's a Patreon link in the description below. You can support me there, but that's completely optional on your part. Thanks again, and I'll see you soon for another video.